So now I'd like to introduce today's keynote interview. As you may know, at Twimmel, our focus is on enriching the lives of our community, that's you and your communities, by highlighting and amplifying the voices of a broad and diverse spectrum of machine learning and AI researchers, practitioners, learners, and innovators. Uh, and it's our hope and belief that in doing so, we'll help, help make the field more accessible and inclusive and uh, make what we create as practitioners more representative of our ideals as a society. Uh, advancing ML and AI education is really a key element of our mission. Um, and in that vein, we produce the Twimmel AI podcast, host events like Twimmel Fest and TwimmelCon, and organize a wide variety of educational groups, meetups, uh, and courses. Uh, and I'm excited to introduce our keynote guest for today. Sal Khan is the founder and CEO of Khan Academy. Uh, he's spent the past 15 years thinking about how technology can be used to advance education. In 2009, Sal walked away from a high paying hedge fund job to start Khan Academy, a nonprofit teaching platform that offers free lessons in math, science, and humanities in multiple languages to millions of students around the world. His work is an inspiration to me and so many others. Sal Khan, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thanks for having me here, Sam. Hey, I am super excited to dig into your story and uh, chat with you about your perspective on education. Uh, for those who are not familiar with your story, tell us how Cat Khan Academy got started. You were working to, to tutor one of your cousins. That, that's right. If you go back 2004, I'm older than I'd like to admit, uh, 2004, <laughs> I was a year out of uh, business school. I was, you know, I, originally I was working in tech, but then after business school, I, I was an analyst at a hedge fund in Boston. And uh, my family from New Orleans, which is where I was born and raised, they were coming up to Boston uh, after my wedding. And it just came out of conversation that my 12 year old cousin Nadia was having trouble with math. And I offered to tutor her when she goes back to New Orleans, tutor her remotely. She reluctantly agreed. And, uh, you know, I started working with her and slowly but surely she got unit conversion, which was what she was having trouble with, got caught up with her class, a little ahead of her class. At that point, I became what I call a, a tiger cousin. And I called up her school and I said, you know, I really think Nadia Rahman should be able to retake her placement exam from last year. She, they had put her into a slower math class because of her bombing uh, unit conversion the previous year. And they let her, they said, you know, kind of, who are you? And I said, I'm her cousin. And they, they let her surprisingly. <laughs> and uh, that same Nadia that a few months ago was put into a remedial math class was then put into an advanced math class. So I was kind of hooked. It was a fun way for me to connect with a cousin that was, you know, 2000 miles away. And then I started working with her younger brothers over the next year or two word spreads my, in my family that free tutoring is going on. I find myself with 10, 15 cousins, family, friends all over the country. Um, and you know, I, I saw a common pattern that they all had gaps in their knowledge. That's why they were having difficulty, especially in subjects like math, uh, where the reason why they were having trouble in algebra classes because they really didn't master decimals in fifth grade or negative numbers were still a little bit shaky from seventh grade. And so I started writing software for them. Uh, really, it's just kind of a fun hobby. Uh, uh, use that muscle that I wasn't using uh, from my past to, to create exercises for them, for me to be able to keep track of what they were doing so they could fill in their gaps. That was the first Khan Academy, it had nothing to do with videos. And then a little while, it was probably November of 2000, in fact, for sure, November of 2006, uh, I was showing all of this off at a dinner party. All my friends knew that I had this kind of crazy family project. And the host of the party, his name's Zuli Ramzan, I have to give him credit. He said, well, Sal, this is cool, but how are you scaling your actual lessons? I said, you're right, Zuli, it's hard to do with 15 cousins what I was able to do with just one or two. And he says, well, why don't you record your lessons as videos onto YouTube for your family? And my, I immediately said, Zuli, that is a horrible idea. Uh, YouTube is for cats playing piano. It is not for serious mathematics. But I went home that weekend, got over the idea that it was not my idea. And I, I gave it a shot. And, uh, you know, I was just making stuff that I, I felt that I was kept, ha kept having to repeat over and over again. And after about a month, I told my cousins, like, what do you think? And they famously told me they like me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and so I took that as positive feedback. I run optimistic. And, and they, you know, in all seriousness, they really appreciated having me like on the phone, dig deeper. But 
it was nice to also have an on-demand version of their cousin that was infinitely patient that you could you know listen at two, t- double speed or half speed or be available in the middle of the night or there's no shame of being able to review something from a few grade levels before and so i kept going both working on the software and the videos uh by you know it, it was actually qu- pretty fast it was clear that people who were not my cousins were using it you know i was getting letters from all over the world on how it was helping people you know, even people in the military and how they were going back to college based on this. I mean, it was, it was wild for me that this little family hobby was growing. By 2009, there were about 50 or 100,000 folks, depending on the month, who were using it every month. And I, I had trouble focusing on my day job. So that's when my wife and I, we sat down, we looked at our finances. It looked like, you know, we were trying to save money at the time for a house, but it's like maybe we could live off of this for a little bit. She was in, in residency for uh, as a doctor. Uh, so she was making a little bit of money at the time. And so uh, uh, that's, you know, I quit my day job, set up Khan Academy as a not-for-profit with the mission of providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere, and, uh, you know, jumped in. And that first year was hard, very hard. We were, you know, depleting our savings. Uh, but, you know, by the end of that year, we got some of our first uh, 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 support, philanthropic support. And, you know, since then, we've just been trying to move as fast as we can to serve as many people as possible. That's awesome. So fast forward to 2020, what does Khan Academy as both an organization and a platform look like today? Yeah, you know, just in like kind of raw scale, we have 100 and something million, I think 115 million registered users, Uh, depending on the month, 20 to 30 million students take some form of learning action. And these are students of all different ages, take some type of learning action every month. Uh, In terms of what it is, what they're using, you know, there's kind of three pillars of Khan Academy. One is we want to make all of the core academic material from pre-K through the core of college available to everyone on the planet. So English is clearly in the U.S. is where we're, we've been leading with, but there's a fully Spanish Khan Academy, Brazilian Portuguese Khan Academy. There's actually 46 translation projects around the world. Math is where we are strongest. I mean, you literally can in most of the world's major languages start at pre-K in math on Khan Academy. We have an early learning app called Khan Academy Kids, which is math, reading, writing, and social emotional learning. Uh, but then you can kind of graduate into elementary, middle, high school, early college, um, even actually mid-college math. Uh, we have a lot of sciences. We're doing a big push as we speak to have all of the middle school and high school sciences available. Uh, and we're starting to, to do a little bit in other subjects in the humanities. And another principle is that we want all of that to be available in a way that personalizes to the needs of the student. So instead of just making it available the way that it's always been available in like textbook form or even video form, make it so that students get as much practice feedback and recommendations based on what they need to really master the concept so that they don't end up the way my cousins were ending up in 2004 with gaps that were, were debilitating. And then the, the third aspiration is how, do, how does someone take that knowledge and how does it lead to actual opportunity, uh, which is uh, you know, something that I'm actively exploring. Awesome. So uh, that personalization point is an important one in our community because it leads into a conversation around machine learning and the way that that uh, might uh, impact ed tech broadly. Uh, I want to come back to that. I also want to come back to kind of the broader role of community in education. I want to start with, you know, where we are today, and that is in the midst of a global pandemic uh, and one that has. Uh, made some pretty dramatic shifts in the way education is delivered in this country and worldwide. And um, I'm curious your your take on the the way, uh, you know, coronavirus is leading to distance education and how this, you know, plays out, you know, both for the primary, ga- primary grades, but also uh, in terms of adult education, which is the, the focus of our community. Yeah, you know, to be clear, I, you know, I'm oftentimes like the poster child for online learning, or you know, which is sometimes <laughs> equated with distance learning. Which, and you know, it's related to distance learning, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, but I'll be the first to say that distance learning is, especially the form of distance learning that we've been kind of forced into because of the COVID, because of COVID, is suboptimal for the great, great majority of students. I'll also be the first to say, you know, as something of a poster child for online learning. If I had to pick between an amazing teacher, especially an amazing teacher in person uh, versus the best technology on the planet, I would pick the amazing teacher every time. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for me, it's never been technology for technology's sake. It's always been, what what are we trying to do? Like, what are the goals for the, the student? And, you know, we want them to master concepts, build agency, 
we want them to always be able to engage at their learning edge. That's, I think, some good pedagogical principles. We, you know, we could even elevate from there thinking about what does it mean to have purpose and happiness. But at minimum, on an academic level, you want them to master the concepts, feel like they're engaged at their learning edge, be motivated in that engagement. And they're always the number one thing is going to be an amazing teacher. But we know, and every teacher will tell you, they walk in room of 30 kids. Those 30 kids are all over the place. I saw this with my cousins when I was even working with five or 10 of them, 15 of them. But when you have 30 kids, they all have different gaps. They're ready to learn at different paces. And in a traditional academic model, you kind of move lockstep, which is what causes the gaps. You know, we move lockstep. You get an 80% on a test. I get a 70% on a test. Even though you didn't know 20%, I didn't know 30%. The, you know, you, you kind of get your grade identifying the gaps, but then it moves on somehow mm -hmm. assuming that you can learn something more advanced based on those gaps. And every, so every teacher has always known this has been an issue, you know, thing in ed schools, they've always taught about differentiation, trying to meet every student where they are, but that's very hard. If you're one teacher with 30 kids with a wide variety of, of preparedness. Uh, and that's where technology can be interesting. Can you allow, can something like Khan Academy allow kids to practice as, at their own time and pace on what is necessary for them, get video instruction when necessary so, and that with the teacher being able to keep track of all of that and then being able to do more focused interventions, uh, you know, small group interventions, game simulations, Socratic dialogue. So you, they, they, they really uh, go up the value chain. But on the COVID situation, on top of it, you know, well, the, the number one thing, it, it, it's, it's very suboptimal. And it, unfortunately, it's disproportionately suboptimal uh, because, you know, people talk a lot about a K-shaped recovery in the economy. It took me a while to process the K, but I realized it's this part of the K that people are talking about mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, there are some people, the people, you know, the upper half of the economy are doing just fine, but service workers, other folks are really struggling right now. I think you're going to, we're seeing, frankly, something very similar in um, education where, you know, as you move to distance learning, first of all, you know, it was the schools that were already reasonably well-resourced that were able to move to a reasonable form of distance learning faster while some of the larger schools that had, you know, or larger districts that had more complexities had to, had to frankly juggle a lot more to be able to move into distance learning. Then you had the issues of the digital divide. You know, if your parents aren't at home to support you, you know, even food security is an issue. I mean, we're, we're seeing around the country, five, 10% of the population, even when they're able to get laptops to them, get them internet access, they're disengaging. So I, I actually think like people aren't like as bad as it looks, it actually might be worse. Uh, so, you know, a lot of what we're gearing up for is as we hopefully get to some form of normalcy, maybe a year from now, uh, that we really view it as kind of a, you know, disaster recovery type of effort. Uh, and this is, is going to be more important than ever to make sure that kids have outlets to fill in their gaps and work on, on and, and so they have a strong foundation so they can re-engage, you know, at their grade level or beyond. How have you seen it impact the, you know, the business and kind of the folks not from a business perspective, but in terms of the courses that you're offering, have you seen a market uh, ramp in the you know folks taking your courses or um, or no? Yeah, in the spring we saw a 2.5x of normal, and you know registrations were through the roof. Uh, parent registrations were 20 times normal, and teacher <laughs> registrations were 10 times normal. And we've seen kind of similar trends as you go uh, as we're picking back up uh, this this current back to school. You know. What we other than just kind of trying to keep everything up and running, we've also been creating a lot of, I guess you call it training material webinars for parents and teachers of just like, how can you do distance learning well? We realized that so many schools were so caught up with just like, can they open? Can they not open? You know, where do you put the plexiglass? All of those questions that they really didn't have a lot of chance to think about, well, what does good instruction look like yeah. in, in this world? And so above and beyond the asynchronous learning that you can do on Khan Academy, and obviously clearly a lot of folks are right now, we've also been putting out points of view of like, what does is, what is good video conference look like? You know, how do you mix it up? How do you make sure kids are engaged? You know, how do you pull them out of the screen? Don't lecture at them, that might as well be a video. Pull them out, ask them questions, leverage breakouts every 20 minutes or so, do a fun exercise that might not have anything to do with the topics just to get people's uh, blood flowing a little bit. Um, and then we've been creating, you know, going back to this kind of disaster recovery, we've been creating what we call get ready for grade level courses. Uh, these are courses that let's say you're entering sixth grade. This is another course called the get ready for sixth grade course, which has all of the prerequisites that you need going into sixth grade. And you can take our course challenge, which is kind of a summative of the whole thing. 
And if you do fine, that means you're ready for sixth grade. But if you if you don't do so well, that means you have gaps. But then you have an opportunity to use that get ready for sixth grade course and fill in all those gaps. So we really accelerated the development of that. And it's not just for sixth grade, it's for for second, third grade, all the way up to pre-calculus. Um, so that either this school year or next school year, and frankly forever, this has always been a problem, kids have the opportunity to identify their gaps and fill them in so that they can be more ready to work at, at whatever level uh, they need to. So we've just been running as fast there. I've also been spawning off some, some new projects. Uh, there's a new project. It's related to Khan Academy. It's related to the mission of Khan Academy, but I've set it up as a separate not-for-profit for now. Uh, it's called schoolhouse.world. And this is where, you know, you saw this massive imbalance in access to live instruction. And so schoolhouse.world is a place where students can get free group tutoring. And we're starting in math. Uh, but we're going to expand to hopefully as many subjects as possible. And it's a place where vetted tutors, anyone listening, can go. There's a little application process, a way to get vet vetted, a way to certify your knowledge as a tutor, and then you can tutor students. And so, you know, this is something we're really excited about as um, a, an added layer. You know, if, if the yeah. practice on Khan Academy, the solutions, the videos aren't enough, you now can get help uh, from people around the world. Got it. So K to 12 is a, a touchstone for you for obvious reasons. It's a, a huge opportunity to, to impact education. Um, at the same time, Khan Academy offers some amazing resources for adults. I've used some of the statistics resources on, on Khan Academy and studying machine learning, and I know lots of others in our community have as well. How does the, the things that you're observing in terms of, you know, engagement and the shift that's happening and what you've learned about the way to, to make uh, online education successful uh, for K to 12 translate to the adult learner. Yeah. And, you know, it depends, you know, adult learner could be college level or could be beyond college level. But, you know, what you just highlighted is you know, right now, especially as an adult, especially as a reasonably motivated adult, like there's really no end to what you can learn uh, between, you know, Khan Academy's got your got you covered. If you need a lot of that foundational material statistics, you just mentioned the calculus, the linear algebra, the physics, uh, you know, the things that might lead into uh, advanced study in something. And then obviously you can then leverage MOOCs or other things to to kind of go even deeper and, and you can you can get to the cutting edge. Uh, quite fast. And, you know, I think that the, the existence of all of these tools, plus, frankly, COVID and higher education having to like say like, well, OK, do we bring people on? Do we not? Well, what is the whole purpose of campus anyway? That's, I think, creating it's creating, I think, a healthy conversation that we've always should have had about like, yeah, like what are the pieces that we're saying as an education? Which of these we should not change and do or double down on and which of these things are like, yeah, that's just kind of tradition, but it's not clear that it's adding value and it's kind of creating an unbundling. I mean, you know, this year, almost every college student is thinking in a very unbundled way, right? They're thinking about, well, maybe I could take this course from the, you know, virtually from, you know, a MOOC or community college, or I can get credit in some new way. And there's new ways that are popping up every day. And, but, you know, when, but, you know, maybe I go to campus for this kind of stuff or, um, and it's making universities realize that, yeah, and, you know, I, I'm not, not to not to be self-righteous, but like I've been saying this for, for a decade, these 300 person lecture halls, I mean, even a 30 person lecture, but a, a 300 person lecture makes absolutely no sense in this day and age. And especially as, as much as college is charging to bring people into a room. Uh, you know, and, and just say, look at this lecturer who's giving probably a canned lecture that they've given for the last 20 years. Um, not a good use of resources. And I actually think finally people are realizing that because like, you know, some universities, you know, there's a whole spectrum of how, how much they've opened, but some of them have the kids come to campus, but to protect the faculty, everything's happening virtually. And, you know, pe people ironically feel more guilty lecturing over Zoom then they feel lecturing in front of people live, even though there, there should be equivalent guilt. <laughs> it should, guilt it should be sense. like, if I lecture you for 90 minutes over video conference, which I'll try to avoid doing today, but if I did that, like that could, that should, could and should be a video. And ideally it should be like chunked up into 10 minutes and you should be able to scrub through it and only go to the point parts that you really care about. Like, and that's obvious actually now to people, like you shouldn't just lecture on video for on, on zoom or video conference. Uh, but people have been doing that forever in a, like a live lecture hall, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so I think if there's a silver lining at K-12 or higher education or even beyond, people are like, OK, if we're live, we got to leverage the fact that we're real live human beings. We should talk to each other. We should have a conversation. We should go into breakouts. We should challenge each other. And, and we all know that's that's how the learning really happens or we should do things together. We should build things together. Um, and, and so I suspect even when we get back to normalcy and, and higher education, you're going to see a much bigger push there. Frankly, the universities that don't go in that direction are going to have trouble justifying their existence if they don't really say, hey, when you come on our campus, this is how we're going to make you interact. If we're just saying you're going to sit and listen to things and then take a test, you know, a term later, uh, that that can be done other places. Mm -hmm. uh, that point of interaction is a, a super interesting one. It's been the foundation of the way we've approached, um, you know, education through creating study groups for folks to learn online courses together. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how the the idea of community and interaction, um, you know, exists within the Khan Academy world and, you know, what you've seen work, what you've seen not work. Yeah, you know, on, on, on the Khan Academy layer, there's, there's a light form of community and that's primarily, you know, there's, you know, between under a video, you can ask questions and other people answer. And it's very, you know, the good thing about Khan Academy, you know, no one goes to, to our site to kind of you know, vandalize it or, or to be a troll. So you actually have very good level of discourse. Like we really haven't had to police a lot and it, it's very good. And I'm hoping, and you know, the schoolhouse.world project, which is around peer to peer tutoring, this has always been my dream that Khan Academy would feel like a real academy that not only could we learn stuff, but we can meet each other, we can help each other. And so schoolhouse.world, which is once again, a separate non for profit, that's where I'm experimenting with that layer. Can we can we get humans to interact with each other and tutor each other and form a genuine global learning community? And it's funny, every time I say that, you know, we're so used to being cynical about each other. People say, oh, you gotta watch out for the, you know, this and that. And I'm like, yeah, we are gonna watch out. That's where we're doing group tutoring and, you know, where we can, we'll do background checks and we're gonna vet people. Like, we're gonna do all of those things. But the reality is, you know, we've been doing it for about two months now. It's, it's just, most people are really good. Most people are really good. And if they're showing up at a place to either get tutoring or to tutor someone else, they're not showing up to troll. And you see just completely different, frankly, you see a different internet than you see, than you see um, pretty much anywhere, anywhere else. You, you, you see pe the best of people uh, coming out. I mean, there's a, there's actually two 13 year olds on schoolhouse who have been, who've, who've been uh, tutoring a 50 year old factory worker who wants to get his GED and he just took a practice test and he passed and he sent us this glowing review. But how beautiful is that? And like, they're awesome. like all over the world. Uh, that That's the kind of stuff that I, I hope we can unlock. And I think learning is the place where we can find some common ground and hopefully depolarize a little bit. And so is, is that the premise of schoolhouse that you just put them together and magic happens or are there, is there a way that you're thinking about creating community and kind of spurring engagement that is, you know, sets the stage for uh, the interactions that you want to see? Yeah, no, it's, it's not just, you know, we'll randomly hope. <laughs> and the early, although you never know, I mean, but the, no, no, it, it has been, I mean, what's been really cool, it's been forming kind of Wikipedia style where, um, you know, there's also been volunteers. I mean, we have professors from England, I mean, really qualified people in kind of traditional sense who have been leading committees on like, how do you ensure tutor quality? How do you ensure teacher tutor safety? And so they're coming up with policies, you know, the first five times you tutor, there's going to be someone else there to kind of monitor it. It's group tutoring sessions. There's a review mechanism so that, you know, if someone is doing a good job or not, there's, you know, there's policies around like, you know, don't, if someone says, meet me at the 7-Eleven, don't meet them at the 7-Eleven and flag them. You know, um, if if uh, we also have a, a mechanism where people can certify their knowledge. So, you know, even if someone isn't kind of a shady character, uh, but, you know, we need to also make sure that they know the material before that, you know, someone shows up for a tutoring session and, and potentially learns something incorrectly. So we have a, a certification mechanism where someone records themselves on Khan Academy, passing a unit test, getting a 90% plus, actually mastering a unit test. Uh, and then they submit that to the community. The community peer reviews that. And if it looks like, yep, that's Sam's work. He didn't cheat. He and he had that. You have to think out loud while you're doing it. And he explained his reasoning quite well. Yep, we've certified him in 
in limits in unit one of calculus. And it's the same taxonomy as, as Khan Academy's taxonomy. So, you know, if people, the way people look at it is like, oh, I'm having trouble with unit three and algebra two on Khan Academy. They go to schoolhouse, they go to unit three, algebra two. Oh, the, look, there's already three sessions coming up this week. I'm going to sign up for one. Or actually, there's no sessions. Let me request one. And then the tutors can see where there's man. Mm. Oh, that's great. Uh, so we we talked. You mentioned personalization uh, earlier as one of the opportunities uh, ahead of us. Um, have you given much thought to the role that machine learning and artificial intelligence creates in uh, helping to to personalize education and um, and you know through recommendations and and other mechanisms? Yeah, a lot, a lot of thought. And, and, you know, what I'm about to say will be maybe a little counterintuitive or surprising. So in 2000, I want to say 2012 ish, we had a big push to do machine learning for recommendations on Khan Academy, like a big push. Like we looked at, you know, okay. we did all, all the things that everyone here knows how to do. And, and well, as of 2012 and <laughs> what, what we found is it was honestly giving weird recommendations. Um, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe it could have been an implementation thing. Clearly, you know, our theory was maybe the data that we were training on wasn't optimal. But the other thing we found is even when it was giving reasonably good, rec it wasn't always giving weird recommendations. Oftentimes it gave very good. A weird recommendation? Um, like a student shows up, you know, they haven't mastered most of sixth grade, but it asks them to go straight to like a fairly difficult word problem. Um, and there, there, you know, I could kind of think of like, maybe this thing is a genius because by having exposure to that word problem or it, it has, you know, cause it, it was, it was trying to make inferences about everything else about like, okay, if someone shows evidence of this, not only the, how does it affect our accuracy model of the probability of someone being able to get that question right again, but also what's the probability of other questions. So, you know, we, we thought we were doing all the right stuff, but every now and then it was giving kind of weird edge case. Like, why is it doing that? The other, the other issue is students themselves even when like i as a tutor could understand oh that's what it's trying to recommend because that's a really important concept from a student's point of view it felt very disjoint like the students like why is this why am i getting recommended this or why am i getting recommended that or why did it skip all of these skills which if i were to just go in order on khan academy would have been next but it just skipped to the next one i kind of want to go in order um and so we actually undid all of that about uh four or five years ago to do kind of a very like basic like you know let's just get some human curators in there linearize the order but give students the agency to pick what order they want to do it in put some game mechanics in there so people can kind of say oh i haven't filled in that tile yet or i want to get that part to be uh, dark blue um and 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 have kind of a simple heuristics for for recommendations which you know is essentially like what's the next thing that you haven't mastered yet or you haven't seen yeah. And, and, you know, in a lot of ways, that was a massive improvement because now people got it. It was very understandable. Now, with all of that said, I'm hoping over the next two or three years to do another push and do it right, where we'll hopefully get the best of both worlds, where like the students can kind of see their, their, the, 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 the universe of things that they could do, and they can take the control if they want. And even that can inform, you know, what, whatever form of machine learning or AI we do. Uh, but also have a recommendation engine. Uh, you know, now that we are formally partnering with school districts, uh, we actually have better data to train off of too. I mean, our old training data, we train off of sixth grade math, but we didn't know, if, is that really a sixth grader? Is that really a teacher who's just sampling the stuff? Is that, you know, is that a, a, a 20 year old who's trying to get energy points, which is kind of our game mechanic on. So, but now when people are working on Khan Academy, at least in certain contexts, we say, okay, that is a sixth grader in this school district. So I think we'll also have better uh, training data uh, to be able to make, to, to be able to have a better go at it. Mm -hmm. Um, and does some of that have to relate to the, uh, the kind of the granularity? It sounds like you are making your recommendations at the course level, as opposed to an individual skill level, or is that not the case? No, we make the recommendations at individual skill level, okay. but like within a course, it was kind of, it was jumping around in, in, in at least counterintuitive ways. Uh, maybe one could rationalize, I, 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 you know, once again, I don't want to, this isn't a machine learning problem. I think it was our right. implementation problem, but it was one of those things. And I always remind myself as a, you know, as a technologist, I, I do also always want to go to kind of the fanciest thing that I think is going to, but I've had the lesson several times at Khan Academy. Sometimes you have to reset to a simple thing that solves the problem and then re rebuild to the, to, to, and only go to the fancy thing if it's really going to solve the problem. 
Yeah, there are some horror stories of the way machine learning and AI are being used in education. One that jumps out at me is a NPR story about robo graders where you know, these very well educated parents, in fact, educated enough to reverse engineer the grading algorithm, you know, were struggling with trying to get their kids' essays graded correctly. Uh, and, um, you know, ended up finding that if they just gave long, complex gibberish, they, the kid got a better grade. And I'm curious if you, you know, do you use robo graders? Do you think about the, the other side of, um, you know, machine learning beyond, you know, recommendations and how it, um, you know, is being used broadly in education and, and, uh, how it might be used for Khan Academy? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the only place we use that or we kind of partner with someone is, you know, we're the official practice for the SAT. And as part of that, there's a place where students can do like practice essays and it leverages a partner called Turnitin, which has some form of AI based robo grader to give feedback around that. And it, it's actually surprisingly good. I've played around with it. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's surprisingly good at that. Uh, but with that said, I, I also have a lot of skeptic skepticism on these types of things. I mean, I saw the trailer right before I showed up and, you know, I'm also worried about the biases, like a certain topics or certain views or certain, like, could that also influence it? And, and that's why, you know, I'm really, I, I'm actually more intrigued for some of these things by the power of peer to peer and the power of kind of human networks to uh, evaluate each other. And even there, you obviously have to be very careful about bias, et cetera, et cetera. But then it's it's a little bit more transparent about what's about what's what's going on. Um, so you know we don't do it today, but let's say in the future you write an essay and you submit it for peer evaluation on Schoolhouse. You know we will be able to you know maybe three or five folks can look at the essay, look at it on a rubric, and you know they're motivated to do so because their essay is only going to get graded if they look at other people. And then you, there's all sorts of stuff. You know, I think everyone here could imagine where you can say, okay, there's hard graders, easy graders, biased graders, and then you can, you can uh, adjust them accordingly. So I'm fascinated by that kind of uh, thing. And then you could even do, if you wanted to discover bias, there's ways that you could even like tweak an essay, hear the air a little bit, and then see how the how the community grades it differently if it's tweaked in a certain different way. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's where I, I really want to, because I don't, I think that's untapped. You know, there, we talk about AI, I think even human intelligence, it hasn't been fully, fully, fully tapped for these types of things. Uh, but the real dream is that it's both, I think, where in some ways they're checks on each other, uh, where uh, one, the human intelligence can you be used to train the artificial intelligence. And then the artificial intelligence, obviously, as everyone here knows, you can get more scale. And then you can also maybe have checks on the human intelligence uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, something something weird isn't going on or or, or, or something like that. So uh, I, I think it's it's going to be a, a journey of of leveraging both. Yeah. Yeah. How closely do you track the broader ed tech market? And um, I'm curious what what have you seen out there that's you know, interesting? You know, I, 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 I kind of peripherally keep track of a lot of stuff, but then, you know, one thing I found in, in, in general, in startups, you know, in the late nineties, I'd done some startups and I'd, it was so emotionally traumatic that I, I swore off entrepreneurship for like the rest of my life. Uh, but clearly I, I, my, I, I didn't, <laughs> but, but the, uh, it, I, I keep getting sucked back in. But one thing I find as a, I guess if you, you know, an entrepreneur, so like you have to definitely be aware, you have to be very honest of like what other people are doing well, but at the same time, you have to be, just be really focused on your lane and, and constantly improving it because it is true. You know, someone kind of sends me an email or texts me or, uh, or, you know, when we had offices, walked into my office and said, hey, have you seen this? And there'll be some new, hey, you know, algebra problem solver or some AI that can do this or that. Hey, yeah. this is the future. We got to do this. And I was like, maybe. Um, but, you know, I, I found that some of this stuff cycles quite quickly. Uh, and, it, you know, you, you oftentimes have to put one foot in front of the other. And in terms of the stuff that, you know, I'm I'm intrigued by, you know, obviously I'm intrigued by a lot of the stuff I just mentioned, the peer to peer the ability to, to for, for communities to tutor each other. Um, you know, I don't know if this, this isn't ed tech, but I think some of the things that are really powerful for the system, you know, some of these programs that are independent of higher education, but you can be very gainfully employed at the end of it, I think are very interesting innovations in, in, in higher ed. Uh, you have 
programs like 42, which is like this, you know, coding school where it's like the tuition is, I think, $300 for four years or something like that. Um, and and they, they seem to be producing very high quality um, engineers. Uh, I'm intrigued. You know, I just talked to uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the education commissioner in New Hampshire, and they're telling me about laws that they have passed that that move from a seat time based world to a mastery based world. So in New Hampshire, there have to be mechanisms where a student can show mastery and then test out of things. And vice versa, if a student just sits in a chair for a year, they shouldn't just be promoted. They have to show mastery before they're promoted. So, you know, that's not technology. It's not high tech, but like that's the kind of stuff that I think starts unlocking the doors for innovation, uh, uh, innovation to occur. You know, I've, I've caught, I've heard about, um, you know, you know, the Googles and the Amazons of the world coming up with kind of certification or kind of coding challenges uh, that can be used to assess folks. I'm intrigued by that, like makes all the sense in the world, uh, at least for that first few levels of, of, of interviews. You know, it's always blown my mind that, you know, in, in tech, the first few rounds of an interview are pretty much, they're pretty nor similar from one major company to the next. But once you, you know, and let's say round four, you get rejected because for whatever reason, like you should get some kind of certificate for those first three rounds so that someone else doesn't have to do it to you again. It saves <laughs> both sides a lot of energy. I mean, any fast growing startup will tell you most of their time has been spent interviewing people. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think I, I view, that's how my brain, I don't view it as so much as the technology that's interesting to me. You know, I, I do get emails about people having some AI that, you know, can solve algebra equations and for me, those feel more niche kind of point solutions. I haven't seen some of those that I think, oh, that's going to change everything. The things that are going to change everything are these things that are like, wow, that's a new form of credential and that could be a new pathway or that's a new way for people to interact that actually could be very scalable, low cost and highly effective. Those are the things that get me excited. Yeah, well, you referenced the some of the things that uh, in terms of new credentials, Google announced something relatively recently. Um, yeah, I'm curious how you think about education broadly as kind of this vocational thing that is helping people create better opportunities versus, you know, maybe the way we think traditionally about uh, humanities education, helping us create a better society or become better people. Yeah. And, you know, I've thought a lot, a lot about this and, you know, if you go to most universities and they say, well, we're not really teaching you job skills we're teaching you how to think we're teaching you how to and i i kind of buy that i mean i kind of felt you know when i went to college it was a formative experience i met a lot of great friends i had you know i met my wife there. like it was it was all of that but you know my answer back to the you know the universities is like well you study everything else like you're, you almost have trouble finding things that you want to research but you have never researched your own claims about your own university that you are happy to charge you know, $200,000 for and like give kids like debt that they can never get off their back for the rest of their life. So you should make a, you should study that. Like if you think that what you're doing is truly helping kids become better human beings, there's got to be a way that you can measure that. Um, or, you know, more well-rounded, there's got to be a way that you can measure that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, I think most of us know, even without doing a study that if, if you go four or five years out of college, and if you gave even, you know, even someone who's a bio major, if you gave them a freshman bio exam, they're likely to flunk it. So there's not much content retention. And that if you did a, like a true control study of like someone entering in and an equivalent who went to a different university, I don't think you're really going to see a statistical difference uh, based on if they're the same person going in. Um, and, and, you know, for some kids, maybe one university works out better and they just kind of confirmation bias. They see, I made the right decision, but for you know, there's people who go to very fancy universities and really have trouble, um, not, not even trouble academically, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not in a good place emotionally or, or, or whatever else. Um, and, you know, it, and it's not surprising. So it's, it's this big loosey goosey claim in, a, in, a, in these, you know, even though higher ed is all about rigor of thought and all of this. And, you know, but the reality is the higher education system we have is it's a legacy from a system 200 years ago where higher education was a finishing school for gentlemen so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, as all things, if, if so, you know, the elite have it, people aspire, industrial revolution happens, you have a new breed, you know, under Lincoln, you have the land grant colleges where say, well, maybe everyone needs a university education so they can participate in the industrial age. And that was a leveling of the playing field, but they modeled those after the Harvards and the Oxfords of the world. 
where we're going to fill up four years. We're going to have all this stuff in it. And once again, I think all of this stuff is interesting, but I think there's a, a very good conversation about creating alternative pathways uh, so that people have more agency in picking so that they don't, they don't say, okay, this one view is the only pathway that I get to. And the other thing, you know, I, I say, and this is kind of a very, I don't want to, you know, I feel like a, you know, traditionalist viewpoint, uh, but I don't think it's said enough to, to, to young people is yes, it, it is like, I love reading like wonderful books and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and having debates about philosophy, that's all like awesome. But the reality is if after, when you graduate, if you aren't able to support yourself, if you aren't able to uh, pay off your debt, trust me, you're not going to be having, you know, ph ph philosophical conversations with your friends. Um, in fact, the only way you really get to have those philosophical conversations with your friends and read books and all this later on in your life, or I, you can always do that, frankly, but, you know, is when you at least feel empowered, like you feel like you have a purpose, you feel like you can contribute to society, that society values that contribution. So, you know, in a world where so many university grads are unemployed or underemployed right now, uh, you know, having jobs where they really don't feel a sense of purpose um, and they're 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 saddled with a ton of debt. You know, I think yeah. I think it's worth uh, introspecting. Goes back to the hierarchy of needs that you alluded to at the very beginning of the conversation. That's right. I want to uh, work in a few questions from our uh, listening and viewing audience. William is curious about the greatest deficit uh, or opportunities that exist uh, in and for Khan Academy right now. The greatest, um, well, you know, I, th I think the most greatest deficit, uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably deficit slash opportunities. I mean, a lot of what we talked about, like, you know, today we have stories, many, million, you know, a lot of kids who go to Khan Academy, get what they need. They can keep going. And there's a young girl in Afghanistan who Taliban keeps her from going to school. She goes to Khan Academy in like sixth or seventh grade. That becomes her school. She self-taught in English. She goes into, um, it, it, you know, learns algebra, ca calculus, physics, chemistry, bio, decides that she wants to be a quantum physicist, smuggles herself to Pakistan to take the SAT. Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times writes a, a op-ed, Meet Sultana, the Taliban's worst fear. You can look it up. That gets her political asylum to the U.S. And I just connected with her recently. You know, she's now a researcher in quantum computing at Tufts. So there are those people that already can take Khan Academy and just run with it. And, you know, every day I think about, OK, for every Sultana, there might be another few million that just need a little bit more of a push. So I think one of the big opportunities or deficits is how do we get more people into that mindset to be a Sultana? So, because if we got, you know, the, the tools, as we've already talked about, already exist. But there's so many kids that have been told for so long, you're not smart. Why do this? This is boring, whatever. So they, they've just kind of checked out. So I think that's a question and opportunity, you know, we can improve our game mechanics, we'll engage more with classrooms and teachers, hopefully some of what we're doing with the peer to peer are things to engage other incentives, but I think that's a big uh, thing that we need to figure out. Um, how do we leverage AI? How do we leverage human communities? We talked a lot about that. I think the future of certification and credentialing is something that I think is a major opportunity and it's a deficit in the world right now, where all credentials right now are really based on time and money. And they were not really based on capability um, and, and they should be based on capability. They'd be a better signal and they'd be, you know, it would open up how you, how you achieve it. So that's, that's where I see the, you know, and then, you know, the, the deficit, we always have deficits of resources. So I'm always you know, fun, fundraising for Khan Academy. Uh, we, so anyone out there who wants to donate, you know, I just read a bunch of research. One of the, there's several ways to become a happier person. You have to sleep enough, you have to meditate or you don't have to, but you should meditate. Uh, you should be have gratitude and you should do random acts of kindness and give. So, you know, give to Khan Academy, donate. It will make you happier. I'm doing this for you. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Khan Academy is primarily a, a visual delivered via video medium. Have you explored other media like audio, podcasts, uh, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, to be clear, you know, so many people associate us with videos and videos are a big part of who we are. And most people's first experience with Khan Academy tends to be videos. But most of our resources are on the exercise side, on the practice, the feedback. You know, that's where we probably put 80, 90 percent of our of our resources. Uh, you know, we're, we're developing these deep item banks so that you never run out of items and mm. kids can really show their mastery. Um, in terms of other modalities, we haven't directly explored like, you know, audio only it's funny. That was the first time I've ever gotten the question of kind of doing a more low tech uh, modality. We've 
a lot of people said, what about VR? And what about that? Well, maybe one day. <laughs> um, but uh, it's interesting, kind of coming videos. We have heard a lot of people say that they can just listen to them. I think it depends on the topic. You know, a history video, you actually might just be able to listen to it. You'll, you'll kind of miss out on the maps and the timelines. Math video, you might be able to keep track of it. You know, I met a, a young man who was imprisoned at 18 and they, don't, they didn't have internet in the prison. His mom was giving him transcripts of Khan Academy videos, so just printouts of the words, and he was using that to learn. And I mean, this is another this is another wild story. So he gets a, he had a thirty year sentence at age at age eighteen for for dealing marijuana, and he got it commute he got his sentence shortened to fifteen years because he was I guess a good prisoner. So in his early thirties, he gets out. For the last ten years, he'd been like reading Khan Academy transcripts and realized that he really liked math and science. He goes to the community local community college. And he realizes that he's actually way, way more equipped than most of the other kids at the community college. And then he's like a kid in a candy shop because now he gets Khan Academy for real. He gets like the videos, he gets the exercises and he uses our SAT prep and he's like scoring like really well on practice tests. And so he decides to try to stand uh, to, to transfer to Stanford and he's successful at age 32 or 33. And the way I even found out about the story is I was giving a guest lecture at Stanford. And at the end, I said, anyone have any questions? And this guy who's like, didn't seem a lot younger than me, raises his hand. I'm like, I call him. He just starts crying. He just like, I'm like, where's this going to go? I was a little scared. I was like, what's it? Where's this thing going to go? He just starts crying. And he's like, I don't know if I can get it out. I don't know if I can get it out. But like, I'm here, like at Stanford, uh, because, you know, and he told it this whole crazy story. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing that we just figured, how do we make that happen more? Awesome. Awesome. Well, Sal, it's been wonderful uh, to have this opportunity to chat with you. Uh, any parting thoughts or, um, you know, maybe in the form of advice for folks that are, you know, have a, a curious curiosity and, and passion for learning and are, are lifelong learners? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we're, we're in the renaissance of lifelong learning right now. So, you know, I, everyone should make a habit of it. It's good for you. Keep your mind sharp. But I would say, you know, I, I, uh, for a lot of folks who are building technology, you know, technology in theory is all about solving problems. And my best advice, you know, everyone's narrative is going to be different. But for me, what has worked is really immersing myself in problems. You know, before I hire another human being to do something, I often like to do it myself. And I would argue before I even try to make a, a robot do it, I like to do it myself as well um, to really understand the space and understand is it really a problem that needs solving. Uh, but I think there's just so much right now in society. Uh, there's a lot of problems, but those are all opportunities where if you really immerse yourself in the space and, and kind of think of like, what is the easiest, simplest solution that is the next best thing to solve it? I think, you know, there, there's all sorts of good we're going to be able to do in the world together. So roll up your hand, roll up your sleeves and uh, start applying some of the stuff to make change. That's right. Awesome. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. And everyone enjoy uh, the last week of Tomo Fest. <laughs>